So guys, we are going, so everyone should get this out. Let me explain what the next couple of days are going to be like and all the papers that I've given you, okay? So today we'll finish up FRQ 3 and 4 from the mock exam and you'll finalize your grading. Okay, so as we go through the last two FRQs, I'll again kind of point out how you could grade these. Um, and then what you picked up when you came in was... Um, so let me make sure you are clear on this, all right? So yesterday, yesterday, you picked up a yellow, or like a yellowish paper and a pink, right? That had two FRQs on each of the papers. I only assigned two of the four for you to do, okay? So you got F, sorry, R4, R5, R6, R7 yesterday. These are one and two, FRQs one and two practice problems, but I only assigned two of the four. So as a reminder, I assigned R4 yesterday and R7. So those are the only two you need to worry about from yesterday. Today, I gave you a sheet of uh, purple. Purple? I know, I'm killing a lot of trees. Um, it's got R8 on one side and R9 on the other. This is one FRQ3, one FRQ4. I only assigned R9 as tonight homework but let me, I'll come back to that in a second. R8 is the hardest FRQ, which is FRQ3, in my opinion, what I've heard from students. Um, and so I know I'm gonna end up doing this with you anyway. If you wanna attempt it, that's fine, but you'll notice R4 and R7 were yesterday, today is R9. So really I'm giving you three, four-ish if you wanna try FRQ3, okay? This extra little white piece of paper is because I realized after I made all these copies and hole punched them for you, that there's no question. It's just the questions, but where's the picture and the information? So that's this little half white sheet, okay? And so I match it up. Our, this question goes with these, this, this scenario goes with these questions, okay? So that's why you have the two pieces of paper. Now, I won't be here tomorrow, as you all know. I'm having that um, implant done in my mouth. So let me show you, um, so there's no surprises tomorrow, what to expect from the sub. So this is gonna be what goes up, uh, maybe up when my sub is here tomorrow. I'm gonna actually give you two work days this week. So I'm gonna go over the two FRQs with you today, and then you'll have a little bit of time left over to like grade, your, um, grade yourself if you want to. Um, and then tomorrow and Thursday, you can work on AP Classroom, that progress monitoring thing. It's 10 um, completion points homework. It opened yesterday, it closes next Monday. You can use class time to work on that, bring your laptop, or and or um, work on the four FRQs. I included R8, um, but I am gonna do that one with you for sure, all right? But those are the four FRQ practice problems um, that, I've been, that I just went over with you. Um, you can also work on any of your incomplete homeworks because on Thursday, Thursday is when the homework check will be, all right? I will tell you this, these will not be part of the homework check, okay? So these could be later, but not right now, okay? Um, uh, yeah, so that's that, all right? So you're gonna do this stuff tomorrow. Thursday when I come back, I am gonna go around the room, do a homework check, but I also wanna know what you got on your mock exam, just for my own um, record keeping. So I wanna see how you do on this one compared to the one we're gonna do later next week. I'm in class, don't worry, you don't have to come to school again. Um, but that's what the plan is. And so and when I ask you your mock, it's not to judge you. I'm not gonna second guess you. I'm not gonna check your grading. You grading you, like you're doing the best you can with it. Um, don't stress about it. And it's not something I'm gonna share with anyone. It's not gonna affect your grade. It's just for my own kind of, I just wanna see personally how you guys do from mock exam one to mock exam two um, with all the reviewing that we're doing, okay? Any questions for me before we start? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, let me get those out of the way. Okay. So, I'm drowning in paper. I can't find anything because I've got so much paper up here. All right, so guys, remember, um, we're gonna go through it. I'm gonna give you model responses, meaning the best possible answer. 
some of it can be shaved down a little bit, but we're aiming high. We're going to try to be thinking in mathematical complete sentences and writing our symbols and showing work and answering the questions specifically. And that way, if we you know, miss a little bit of that on the actual AP exam, we should be fine. We're going to keep practicing because hopefully it'll start sticking how to like really write these in complete sentences and stuff like that. Um, and as you grade yourself, it is very hard to grade yourself. There's no like real partial credit on this. It's like right or wrong. So it's kind of hard. So if you're unsure of how to grade yourself, shoot low. Go lower rather than higher. Um, just because it's normal that you didn't do great on this. We didn't review. We did not review at all, right? Okay. So let's start this one. And I think FRQ3 is going to be the hardest of the three. Um, let me... So much stuff. Um, FRQ3 is always going to be from Unit 3. It's always going to be a real world problem. They're all six points, no calculator on this one. Um, you're always going to be given a sinusoidal um, description and a picture to go along with it. Um, sinusoidal means sine or cosine. It's one of those two, is what it's going to be modeling. Okay? And the questions are going to be the same no matter what the picture is. These ABC parts down here are the same for all of them. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and read. Um, the Mu Alpha Theta Spring Break 24 retreat was held at Blue Springs State Park in Deland, Florida. Students took turns splashing into cold spring water from a rope swing hanging in a large oak tree near the water's edge. Becca Braveheart is the first to swing. At t equals zero, Becca is over the land and is 18 feet from the water's edge. Then at t equals four seconds, she is 22 feet away from the bank and is swinging over the water. As Becca swings, her position from the bank periodically decreases and increases. That word periodically is really important because it just means it's like that these, these movements would just keep repeating themselves like a wave does, right? One cycle for her would be here in the middle, over here, back to the middle, and back here. So um, we'll see in just a second we're going to be labeling five points to model one period. So one swing forward and swing back, okay? Um, the sinusoidal function S models Becca's position in feet where a negative position represents how far she is to the left of the bank and a positive position represents how far she is to the right of the bank. The periodic behavior is marked on the diagram at the right. So you'll always get a picture to go along with the words. Okay? The graph of S of, S of T and its dashed midlines for two cycles is shown. Five points F, G, H, J, K are labeled on the graph, no scale is indicated, and no axes are present. So from the graph of S of T down is going to be the same on every question, except this could be a, a modeling a sine graph or a cosine graph, and I'll explain that more in a second. That's the only real difference you'll see there. Let's take a look at the picture. We have at T equals zero seconds, when, before time has started, she's starting, 18 feet away from the edge of the water, the bank. Okay, that's called the bank. And then halfway through, it looks like she's you know, wherever that is. And then at four seconds, she's furthest away from her starting point, right? Picture a swing. So she's at the max time, the max distance from where she started. And then she travels back in the same and ends up where you start. So in this graph, it's modeling that, okay? We have five points, one, two, three, four, five. And remember, five points is one cycle. Five points is one cycle. So she starts and ends at the same place. That's true of all sinusoidal graphs. Your fifth point is always at the same y value as your first point, okay? Um, we have a max here, which would represent that. So let's go through and, and do part A, which is to, to determine possible coordinates for X and Y, T or S of T for these five points. This is exactly what you're going to do as your first um, part of this graph. Um, this A, part A, is worth two points. And um, your T values are worth one point, and your S of T values are worth a second point. Okay? So I'm guessing we might not have done so great on this. When you take the um, actual exam, there will be a diagram drawn just like this, labeled just like this. And it'll have these little coordinate places where you're going to insert the coordinate So let's go through that. So we know when she starts, we're at zero seconds, right? That's our T. T is zero. 
And it said that she's 18 feet from the bank. And it told us here, negative position represents how far she is to the left of the bank. So she's 18 feet from the left, uh, from the bank, 18 feet to the left of the bank. And you can see that negative 18 there. Here's the bank, she's at negative 18. We also know that at four seconds, why am I putting it here? Because that's my maximum. That's the highest amount of distance, the largest distance away from our starting point, right? At four seconds, it told us she was at 22 feet from the bank. And you can see that in the picture. So let's decide what the second will be. What would the time be between zero and four? What do you think the time would be right here? Two. Right? It's just halfway in between. So the midpoint, 0 plus 4 divided by 2 is 2. We can apply that same logic for the y values. 22 plus negative 18 without a calculator is 4 divided by 2 is 2. So we just labeled first, second, third position of Becca swinging. Now she's going to go backwards. So at J, and then where she ends will be at K, All right? So what would the, um, for J, what would the time be? So we had 0, 2, 4, what would this one be? 6, and then this one would be 8, okay? Um, and the Y values are the same. Don't forget, even though that there's no labels here on this graph, we're coming up with the labels right now, it's still um, vertical and horizontal, like, these two have to be the same y value. So if this is negative 18, so is this. Plus, think about it. It makes sense. It's where she ends back up again. She started at 0, negative 18. She ends back at negative 18, but it's 8 seconds later. Okay? <laughs> same with this one. At 6 seconds, she went here, 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 and then she went backwards. At 6 seconds, she's right here. It's the same height that she was at at 2 seconds. Right? They're the same y value. So that would be two points right there, being able to come up with those ordered pairs. Now, it said possible, because there are other ways you could label this. You could, as long as the numbers worked out, I mean, I don't know why anyone would change those numbers ever. It's pretty straightforward now that you see it. You can use a lot of what they have there to fill in and then use some of your other little algebra skills like midpoint and stuff and knowing how a graph works to fill in the blanks, okay? But understand there is a possibility that you could have different answers. Part B is the big one that you could have different answers. Okay, what they're wanting us to do is identify all of the variables, these constants, constants just means numbers, um, A, B, C, and D as they are in this cosine graph. So here's the thing. You're just going to be answering the question, what is A, what is B, what is C, and what is D? You're not even having to plug it in. There'll be like a blank. A equals B equals C equals D equals. And you're going to fill in those numbers. Now let's go over what these mean. I mean, it's been since like January since we graphed these. So um, one thing is A is your amplitude, how high and low you go. B affects your period. We'll do that. We'll talk more about that in a second. C is your phase shift. Hate those. And D is your midline, but it's also how far up or how far down you go. Okay? So first thing is this. Um, there's a lot, I, I just, I'm just praying that when I go do, I'm going to be a reader this summer, I think I told you guys I'm going to be grading this summer, I'm praying I don't get assigned this one, because I, I'm thinking about all the possibilities that students could come up with here, um, that would be, make it very difficult to grade. I am always going to go with the most simple, most obvious one, and here's the first thing we're going to talk about. Every time you get the FRQ um, 3 and you're on this part, we want to start with C. C is the worst one. C is your phase shift, okay? Whenever we have a C, and if you remember, it was like parentheses with our, our X value, we would like be so annoyed because it meant you had to move all your points left or right. It was a horizontal shift. Not a fun thing to do. If I can make that a zero, I want to use, I want to make it a zero. It's going to make my whole problem so much easier. So how do I know if I'm allowed to make this a zero? Really, really simple. We, this is a sinusoidal graph. Technically, if they didn't give us that this is a cosine function, we could call this sine or cosine, depending on where you start. So, um, you know, cosine is up, middle, down, middle, up. 
and sine is middle up, middle down, middle. We need to know that. We don't get to start anywhere we want, though. We have to start at point F. That is our first point that's telling us that. So our pattern here is down, middle, up, middle, down. Is that sine or cosine? It's cosine with just a negative amplitude. So our graph matches what they want us to have. I get to make this a zero, okay? If this pattern started in the middle, in other words, it was a sine graph, so it's either going to start down, middle, or up. If it starts up or down, that's a cosine, right? Up, middle, down, middle, up, or negative amplitude, down, middle, up, middle, down. If it starts in the middle, and it either goes middle, up, or middle, down, it's a sine graph. So if this had said sine right here, and we were starting here, we would have to put in a phase shift either to the right or to the left. That gets really, really tricky. We are going to pray to the math gods that we get a graph that matches the pattern of the um, trig function that we want. I'm going to do one with you another day where we, it doesn't, so you have to come up with a C so you can see how it's done, but we're just going to pray, okay? Um, so there, there's the C. We're not going to worry about that. Um, midline is an easy one, too. So it already told us, always like really dissect it. You only have 15 minutes, but that's why we're practicing these, because the questions are going to be exactly the same, okay? This diagram is going to be exactly the same. It's just going to have, maybe it has a different pattern for the reasons I talked about. But you're going to have those same letters labeled like this and all that. So it told us that there's a midline in there, the dashed midline. <coughs> this is my midline. That's also the D value. That's your D value. Um, what is it? Look at your graph. What is that? Two. It's a two. We labeled it already. It's two. All right, half of our letters are done. Let's talk about, um, I don't know, we can do either one. Let's go to amplitude. No, let's do period. Um, if you remember, period is um, how much of the x-axis you use to make five points. So one, two, three, four, five points. It's always going to be five points. We started at zero. We went out to eight. We have a period. I'm going to just write it up here. The period of this graph is eight. Okay? That is not B. Period is not B. We have a formula, period equals, and you probably didn't remember this on the day of. Maybe you did. I mean, we're getting our memories refreshed here. Two pi over B. You have to know that formula because you're going to be able to tell what your period is. Zero to eight makes eight. And then we can plug it into this little baby equation and solve for B. So if I multiply both sides by B, and you're not asked to show this work, okay? So don't think I'm showing all these steps because um, I have to. I'm just showing you so I know you know how to do it. And then divide both sides by eight. So B equals two pi over eight. Simplify your fraction is pi over four. B is pi over four. And I know I'm writing all my answers on here instead of the answer sheet. Just, it's not like you're going to mess that up. It's going to be very straightforward when you take the test of where you're going to put your answers. You'll have an answer booklet, okay, like you did on the mock. All right, and then A. So we know we already decided it's going to be a negative number. We decided that because it starts down, right? Cosine is up, middle, down, middle, up. R starts down, makes our amplitude negative. It's a flip, okay? But now we have to figure out what that number is. So remember, amplitude is how high and how low you go. If your max and your min were the same number, like let's say that's 22 and that's negative 22, A is 22 or negative 22, okay? But when they're different, that means we had an up or down with our D value, okay? So picture this, you graphed these five points and then you said, oh, there's a D. Now I'm gonna take all those points and go up two. Where was 22 and negative 18 before I went up two? Like, let's just use this point. Where was it? 20, yeah. So this would have been at 20, this would have been at negative 20. And then we had to move all the points up two, so we went from negative 20 to negative 18, and positive 20 to 22. So that is our A value. And that's it. You're just writing those numbers and moving on. Do we feel a little bit better about that problem? 
No? <laughs> okay. Um, and th so that's what I'm saying here. If you want to, well, I, I don't even, my brain doesn't work this way where um, even on this problem, you could have had a phase shift and called this like to the right something and that would have changed your first point. You're like, I don't know why someone would want to make it more complicated, but I have these smart students that like to do things a little bit harder because they can, because it's easy for them. So I'm sure I'm going to encounter some of these crazy things I have to grade over the summer. And I'm not looking forward to that. You're reading yours. No, you said I thought you grade like these at the final year. Me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to Missouri in Kansas City, Missouri, for eight days. And I'm grading these tests for eight hours a day with another 360 AP pre-calc teachers from around the country. What? <laughs> well, I, I'm not allowed to grade my own students' ones. That's why they're not, your names are not on them. I'm, I, I mean, how cool is it that I could have yours just come across my desk and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's still his handwriting. I would not remember that. But anyway. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So, you know, a lot of the questions, you guys are the first year kids for the whole country. So just remember that. You were in the same boat as everybody else where your teacher, just like all your other teachers are saying, I don't know how they're gonna grade that. I mean, is that gonna be worth a one point? Or are you gonna get points? I, like, I don't know until I have this summer job. That's why I'm doing it, to be a better teacher for future students. Um, but you guys are, have a very, very, very generous cut score. So I think we're gonna be okay. Um, but we'll talk more about that. All right, the C is two points. So that was worth two points in there. So I guess if you get half of it right, it's a point. So if you have like A and B right, but C and D are wrong, you could still get a point in there. Um, and then these are each worth a point down here. Remember, it's okay. You might get zeros on some of these FRQs right now. We hadn't reviewed, okay? What we're looking for is when we take the, ne the next mop that you earn six or maybe fewer, Points, but at least you can earn more points than you did when you just did this cold, okay? All right, last little part of this. I think this is pretty easy for you guys. Refer to the graph of S in part A. The T coordinate of G is, they're calling it T sub one. That's this one. And T coordinate of H is T sub two. That's this one. And so they're asking on the interval of T sub one to T sub two, which let me just highlight it for you. You will not have a highlighter on the day, so you won't be able to do that, but you can zero in on it or make it darker. Um, <clears throat> what of the, which of the following is true? So this is a multiple choice question. Is this interval positive or negative? Let's answer that. There's no negatives anywhere in there, right? We have the ordered pairs. It's not guessing, right? We know what the ordered pairs are. We know S is not negative, it's positive, okay? The graph is positive right there. Is it increasing or is it decreasing right there? Which one? It's increasing. What, what, what are we thinking? So I know exactly, if you did this one, you're thinking of concavity, right? You're seeing that that's concave down. Remember, when we talk about concavity on a graph with that same annoying increasing, decreasing word, it has to say what word with it. What's the word that goes with increasing or decreasing when we're talking about concavity? Rate. That's in this last part, okay? We're talking about it now. These two questions are going to be identical on the FRQ. It might change it to like, um, no, it won't. It won't change it. These will be the exact. So you're gonna know you're not like, now that we talked about it, no one's gonna get that confused because no, let me get, not stop getting all so ahead of myself and answer the question first. Um, describe how the rate of change is changing on this interval, rate of change. So when we talk about rate, that's when we're talking about concavity, okay? So now we observe that it's concave down on that interval, so the rate is decreasing. Let's continue to try to um, speak right in, um, <clears throat> what is going on? What do I have all this stuff in front of me? Let's continue to try to speak in complete sentences, in math sentences, always shooting high. You don't want to just say um, decreasing. You wouldn't just write decreasing, okay? Put it in a sentence. The graph of S is concave down. You definitely want to mention the concavity. Okay, because that's what we're looking at when we're making this decision. On the interval, of 
t sub one to t sub two. Like you really are writing in a complete sentence is really just taking a lot of the question and putting it in your answer, right? The graph of s is concave down on the interval t sub one to t sub two. So the rate of change is decreasing. So remember, decreasing. Um, down, decreasing. Okay, that is worth a point. So C1 is a point, C2 would be a point. All right. All right, that one's tough. That's why I did not assign this for homework. Even though you have one, it's the clock <laughs> thing I gave you. Um, Jacob, make sure you get it from me because you didn't get it. Um, so I will do that one with you guys on Thursday if you want me to. I'm sure you probably will. Um, so we'll do that one together. But if you want to try it, I mean, of course, please, 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 please do. Please do. Okay, last one. Um, this box will be at the top of your F FRQ4, no matter what questions are in there. Um, it FRQ4 is never going to be real world. It's going to come from unit two and three. Six points, of course. Um, unit one, if you remember, I know you don't, but unit one was um, kind of your algebra level um, lines and parabolas and cubics and cortex and like end behavior, all that stuff, um, rational functions. Unit two is when we got into geometric and arithmetic sequences and logs and exponential functions. And then unit three was trig, sine, cosine, all the fun stuff, okay? So there's gonna be a little from two and a little from three. I'm sure there's gonna be log stuff and some trig stuff. And that's what we're gonna see in this question. And let me read, let me just kind of sum up this box for you. Unless otherwise specified, the domain is all real numbers. It will always be all, it's just real numbers, meaning no imaginary. All of your angle measures should be in radians. So we would never use 30 degrees in place of pi over six, okay? Only radians. Um, if you can simplify, you would always want to simplify. For example, you would never leave any of these as what you see right here. All three of these can be simplified further. So you would. So write a note to yourself if you feel like you need help from me to go over like how to simplify those. I'll be happy to do that with you for you. Because remember, you don't have a calculator. So those should be able to be simplified in your head, okay? Um, also combining like terms when necessary. Like I don't think anyone would leave an answer as like 2x plus 3x. I think you all know that you can make that 5x. Um, you could keep your base, add your exponents there for five to the second times five to the third, keep your base, add your exponents, but you wouldn't need to go further. Without a calculator, they wouldn't expect you to do five times five by hand, okay? Um, you could simplify that by subtracting your exponents, things like that, all right? Um, you might get an answer of e to the power of x plus three. You can't go any further than that, right? Your answer would be e to the power of x plus three. But if you got e to the zero power, you should know that anything to the zero power is one. So things like that, right? And I'll model that for you. So part A has two parts. They're each a point. The whole thing is six points. Um, and it tells us to, for part one to solve g of x, this log equation, for y is two and y is negative one for h of x. So. Part A, I'm going to take my log and set it equal to 2. That's what that meant. And we're going to solve it. Solve the equation. So with log equations, you want to make sure your log and its argument, stuff in parentheses, are by itself first. Okay. If there was like a plus 2 out here or a times 2, you'd have to move it to the other side before you do this step, which is to rewrite it in its other form. So 3 to the second equals 4x minus 7. And then just solve. It's just a, what, kind of a two and a half step equation. Now I'm showing a lot of work here. This adding 7 to both sides, you wouldn't have to show that. You could absolutely jump to 16 equals 4x, okay? Okay. You don't have to show divide by four. You could go right to x equals four. So showing your steps, but you're not having to show every bit of work. So x equals four. Did anybody get that right? Please say you did. Did we forget how to solve logs on that day? Do we remember now? 
Anything else? Is that easy? You just had to remember how to do it? Okay. Thank you, Tyler. Saying a word to me, nodding, Sabine. Everyone else just stared at me. Okay, part two is let's solve h of x. Negative one. Okay, so that's what that meant. So understand, you'll see this. This is exactly what you'll see on FRQ4. That's what's nice, guys. The FRQs are going to have so many of the same things each time, okay? The equations are going to change. But one and two is going to tell you what you're putting on the other side of the equation every time, okay? And then we just have to solve it. So here's a trig equation. So this is unit three. That was unit two. Divide both sides by two. And remember, you're using unit circle here. Where is sine negative one half? So you have to go back into your brain, find that denominator. What's the denominator? No, it's six, right? All of our denominators of three start with square root of three over two and then one half. Don't forget, that's cosine, that sine, okay, sine. Yeah, be careful. Um, and we know sine is negative in three and four, okay? So we add one to our denominator for quadrant three and then at five we go to seven, 11, okay? Let's not box our answers. It's very hard for me not to do that. I'll give you an example of why on this next problem. Um, I am really bad about modeling that for you. I love to do my little curly Q, little circle my answer. It is better not to. You, um, let me do, um, I have a good example of, it, of why here in a second, okay? So I'll explain, I have a better example of why. Um, it's not that you'll get it wrong if you box it, but you, if you, well, I'll, let me explain it with this next one. Okay, part B, functions J and K are given. So there's a trig one, there's another log. Part one is for J of X, we're gonna rewrite it as an expression in which secant X appears once and no other trig functions are involved. So this is your least favorite stuff that we probably did all year where you had to know all those different trig identities and rewrite your um, problem. So we're taking cosine x plus sine x times tan x, and we have to somehow make that into just secant x. Okay, so this is where I would give you that speech of let's not worry so much about the whole plan. We're just planning one step. And one of the tricks of the trade is to change anything that's sine or cosine, anything that's not sine or cosine, to sine or cosine. So I'm going to change tan, but you have to know it. You have to remember that tan is sine over cosine. Remember, um, tan of theta equals y over x. We've been using that formula. Y is sine, x is cosine. It's the same idea. Now, I know, now I don't know how I'm going to do it necessarily, but I know that I have to make this binomial into a monomial, single, secant x. So that means I'm probably going to have to add these words together at some point. So let me start kind of combining these two. This is cosine x. This is like over 1, right? I'm multiplying fractions. I don't need a common denominator. So that would become sine squared x over cosine x, right? Sine x times sine x is sine squared x. And like I said, we're going to have to add these together. Well, to add fractions, we need a common denominator, okay? So my common denominator here would be cosine x, right? So I would have a new fraction with cosine x in the denominator. My first fraction is missing a cosine x in the denominator, so I would multiply it by that to get that. And I, whatever I do to my denominator, I have to do my numerator. Yep, cosine x times cosine x is cosine squared x. And then I don't need to do anything to this fraction. So I just kind of combine that step. I just put my two fractions together. Do you all remember what cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals? One, right. I mean, that is one of your Pythagorean identities. It's like x squared plus y squared equals one. It's just written with trig words. Cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals one over cosine x, and let me keep using arrows, I like the arrows, and then that would equal secant x. So we got to it, okay? 
when we wrote this down in red we had no idea what the steps were you have to just be ok with doing one thing at a time now here's where i can explain to you why you don't want to box it what if i if i box this and don't do it you don't have that in your stuff you look over if i box that and it's right fine ok what if the directions were had said this what if the direction said write your answer in terms of cosine where you only have cosine in your answer so you would have had to stop there ok this is the actual answer not this when you box an answer you are telling the grader the reader this is what you are to look at nothing else whereas when you don't box it we are instructed to look for the answer in there so you might get credit for having this there by not boxing that okay you knew what you were doing you just went too far but if you box it you're saying that's the final answer look at me so let's let's not put ourselves in that situation okay um, B2 is rewrite this as a single log this is really long looking it takes one step to get to the answer and this is just remembering our properties of logs which we went over when we did the multiple choice if you remember but there's three properties the power property product property quotient property product and adding go together <coughs> quotient and subtraction go together and the power is a leading coefficient so when you are combining these into a single log you're only going to have the word log one time there it is so last time I'm going to write log and then I got to do stuff with everybody else. <coughs> uh, take a second look it over I see that we're going to use the power property that 2 is going to go on the 3 to become 3 squared or 9 this 3 is going to go on the parentheses of x plus 1 and there's two minuses minus goes with division or fraction bar okay so it doesn't mean I'm going to do this over this like make that a fraction and then divide that by another number um, it's not a complex fraction it's just anything that has a minus in front of it ends up in the denominator together okay so we'll have the x minus 5 natural log x minus 5 that's that and then over which is divided by that's these two and I'm going to put the 2 on the 3 that makes a 9 that's that and then the 3 on the x plus 1 is that and that's it that's the final answer okay so one two three four points there and lastly we are solving an equation I want you guys to notice that it says all versus the equation we solved up in a2 was just on the unit circle so we just named those two but when it says all and it's going to say all on this problem I'm quite certain we have to write our answer a certain way so I'm going to remind you of that right here so it says so this is just fancy talk it gives us m of x and it says find all input values in the domain of m that yield an output value of zero so find so this is find all input values that's just x when the y value is zero so it's setting this equal to zero and solving for x okay so I'm just going to do sine of 2x minus the square root of 3 cosine x equals 0 these were in parentheses I guess okay so one thing I see here is I've got two different trig functions I'm mixing sine and cosine okay I also want you guys to pick up on the fact that this is a double angle we can rewrite sine 2x as 2 sine x cosine x I would 100% know that one um, it comes up a lot and it's kind of an easy one to remember um, the double angle formulas for cosine we should probably review them but I I just have an instinct that they won't put those on here because there was remember you could write it three different ways there were three different ways to write sine I'm sorry cosine of 2x I just don't think they're gonna ask that this I do all right so you might be thinking well you didn't get rid of mixing the two together we're still mixing sine and cosine together in this problem but what we should pick up on here we've seen it a lot is that this is a binomial and they both have cosine in common you can factor out a word just like you factor out numbers or letters and then whatever is left over goes in the parentheses so I just factored out a cosine from each of those terms 
And now that they're written as factors, you can set them equal to zero separately. So I have cosine x equals zero and two sine x minus the square root of three equals zero. Back to the unit circle here. Anytime I see zero, I like to draw my diagram. I literally draw it. I don't just like picture it in my head. I have to see it. I'm a visual person. I get confused with the zeros in my head. So it just, especially on a high stakes test like this, make sure you know where your cosine value is zero. That would be here and here. And we're not done with that answer. I'll come back to it because we have to address the fact that it said all. Let's just finish it and I can cover those two together. Um, I need to isolate the sine x. I would add the square root of three and divide by two. You do not need to show that work. You could jump right to this if you so choose. And so we need to know where sine is the square root of three over two. That's my denominators of three. And sine is positive in quadrant one and two, okay? So this question is worth two points. Um, I have read that just getting to the purple step is a point, okay? So if you were able to get to that point, even if you did this next part wrong, you just lose one point, okay? Now, the fact that it said all means we're gonna add to this answer. Okay, and this is just how I chose to write it. Um, where, oh wait, no, sorry, plus two pi n for both of these. Remember, coterminal, we can add two pi or subtract two pi, however many positive n's or negative n's we want to, and land at the same place for the set of all real numbers. That n e z, do you remember that? It's been a while since we had to talk about that. This, you have to write that for these, plus two pi n. And we only put plus because n can be negative. That would make you subtract two n, okay? Um, and then this little symbol, n e z, it says, it means um, that n belongs to the set of all real numbers. It's just a shortcut way of writing it. It's very recognized in calculus, so it's totally fine <laughs> to write that. Um, could you write out the words if you forgot the symbols? Yes, okay. And that is it. We have finished the mock exam. So try to kind of sum up your scoring sheet. Hold on to it. Um, you probably have this part done already, right? Looking, you know, worst case scenario, it is on canvas. I know I have it here somewhere. That's what I'm down to do. Maybe if you're missing one, you understand.
Thank you. 